I'm going to focus on uh, on convection uh, for our three planets here, Earth, Mars, and Titan. And I'm going to start off by violating sort of one of the golden rules of talks, which is I'm going to put up a bunch of equations. Um, and I think most everybody has probably seen these, and I'm not going to talk about them in detail. But one of the things I want to point out is that in all of these equations, nowhere does it say Mars, Earth, or Titan. Uh, you might say, okay, maybe some of the constants like C sub P will change, but temperature is temperature. It's the mean kinetic energy of molecules, and that definition remains consistent regardless of the planet you're looking at. Same with pressure, same with winds. Okay, so this system of equations describes atmospheres. And so, these are not planet specific per se, right? And in particular, I want to focus on this term Q dot in the thermodynamic equation. This is the heating rate. Q dot, the heating rate, is a generic heating term. It doesn't care how the atmosphere is heated. It just cares that it is. Okay? And so you can have two different heating processes that produce the same magnitude and same distribution of heating, and you will get the same answer. The equations, the system of equations, don't care about what produces that Q dot. Okay. And this is important. So if we look at Mars, we think phenomenologically, oh, Mars has dust storms. Here's one. Here's another one. Uh, and Earth has dust storms. And so you might say, oh, maybe these are, are similar. Um, that's what our brain likes to do. It likes to categorize things from a phenomenological standpoint. Um, but Earth also has things like thunderstorms, and you say, well, that's completely different than a dust storm on Mars, because after all, that's a thunderstorm from latent heating and water and convection, and dust storms are just dust, okay? Uh, but Titan has storms, so are those like Earth, or are they similar to dust? Well, again, it doesn't matter about what's producing the Q dot. What matters is, is the heating similar? Okay. And there's other things like on Earth, like fires, right? Volcanic eruptions, and even things like atomic bombs. Um, if you can produce a heating that is like that of an atomic bomb, it doesn't have to be an atomic bomb, but the atmosphere will respond the same way. So aliens could come down with a secret weapon that produces a similar thing, and you will get the same exact response. Okay? So, hypothesis. Given similar heating, atmospheres of similar structure, relatively similar structure, should behave in dynamically similar ways. And we're really lucky that we have Earth because we're really familiar with Earth. We've, we've been studying its atmosphere a long time, and we have a pretty good understanding of how different types of heating produce different types of responses. And so um, latent heating is, is a dominant one when we're talking about convection. And so when we look at some of these other planets, we should always be thinking about how does that heating compare to what we know on Earth? And it doesn't matter what the phenomena is. Okay. So let me start off with Earth, uh, thinking about thunderstorms. And as an example, uh, the behavior of thunderstorms, uh, we know, depends very strongly not just on how much instability is there, how much so-called cape is there, but also what the environmental wind structure is. So, for example, in the top, if you just have a no shear wind situation, so wind is constant with height, um, you can you generate uh, a, a vertical updraft, right? And uh, ultimately, at some point, you probably get a downdraft with a cold pool. And uh, from baroclinic vorticity, hot air rises, cold air sinks, you start to develop these, these vorticity centers here. And you can say once you have a cold pool here, the vorticity going in this direction dominates over the vorticity going in this direction. And the result is, over time, the storm tips over. Okay. If you add shear, it does different things. So the shear itself in the environment produces a, a natural rotation in this direction. And therefore, when you get a cold pool, now this and this can balance this and this, and the storm can stay more upright. Okay. <clears throat> and in fact, you can do the combination of these things and look at the so-called bulk Richardson number, which is basically buoyancy or cape divided by shear, more or less. And you get these patterns on Earth that tell you what kind of storms you will get that range from simple cellular storms that are very short time scale, go up, down, and die, to multi-cell storms, to supercell storms that last for hours and can travel, uh, you know, a thousand uh, kilometers, okay? 
So that's the key. So the question is then, or the point is, is that Q dot is Q dot, water or methane matters not. Okay? If you heat the atmosphere in a similar way, whether it's latent heat from water or latent heat from methane release, like on Titan, one should expect to get more or less the same answer. Okay, so this is sort of obvious. Okay, well, storm, the thunderstorm on Earth looks like a storm on Titan. And in fact, if you, if you simulate these, you see that. So on the left side is, is a no shear case. Here's an updraft. That's the cloud here in white. We condensate, it goes up, it comes down, it rains out. The shading colors here are temperature perturbation. So here you can see this cold pool as it evaporates, slam into the ground and spread out. And that's the end of your storm. If you add some shear, though, what you get is a long-lived multicellular system that travels a thousand kilometers or more as it moves across the surface, just like Earth. But of course it is. It's the same equations. Okay. Okay. So a titanic squall line, as I say. Okay, but Q dot is Q dot. Water or dust matters not. So what if we think about Mars dust storms versus storm uh, thunderstorms on Earth or Titan? Okay, so this, uh, it, it, basically, if you take a, a chunk of dusty atmosphere, uh, we know on Mars that dust is radiatively active. It likes to heat up when the sun is shining on it, and it gets hot. And so it shouldn't be surprising that warm air rises, because that's what warm air does. Okay, and it's essentially a Q dot. In the atmosphere, the dynamics don't care that it's dust or that it's radiatively heated. It's equivalent to the dynamics as latent heat release. Okay, so not surprisingly, you can get dust, rock, so-called rocket dust storms, or let's call them cumulonimbus-like dust storms. If you put a blob of dust in there, it's going to rise up almost like a thunderstorm and produce a circulation. And uh, whether you do that individually or you look at sort of complexes of dust, you get these deep plumes of dust, which are shown here in, in black. Uh, and the, the dust itself, or sorry, the vertical velocity here is shown in red. So you get these plumes of rising dust where it's dusty, just like a thunderstorm on Mars or a storm on, on Titan. Okay. So strong solar absorption provides the dieback heating for Mars, what I'm going to call deep convection. All right. So let's think about these Mars dust storms a little bit, because after all, again, Q dot is Q dot. It doesn't really matter. So if you think about a, a Mars dust storm, you can imagine uh, dust, wind blowing in this way. Wind starts to lift dust off near the surface. So it's, you get a very dusty but shallow layer of dust, and it starts to heat up as the sun shines on it, and it becomes buoyant, and it rises. And as the sun shines, you also shade this area over here. So now you have warm and you have cold and you start to develop, in principle, these vorticity centers just like you would for a thunderstorm on Earth. So phenomenologically, our brain says, oh, dust storms, thunderstorms, no, Mars, Earth, different. But to the dynamics, if you can set up the situation, you get the same result because the dynamics have no other choice but to do that. That's the equations. You can't change the laws of physics. Okay, so if we put in a wind profile like this and we can set up the situation, maybe, maybe we can develop a, a dynamical situation where we can get long-lived storms on Mars, dust storms on Mars, local regional storms, because they essentially behave in a dynamical sense, just like thunderstorms on Earth. <clears throat> Here's an actual situation where you might see that. So this is um, a series of, of images here from... Um, the high-rise camera, uh, and you can see these dust streamers being lifted by the wind near the surface. These are shallow in the boundary layer, so that's kind of similar to here, right? And eventually they get caught up into an updraft, okay? And you can actually see the shadowing here, right? You see where it's darker down here, right? So from a radio standpoint, you can see how the situation could, could get established, right? And again, Q dot will drive specific dynamics, and it doesn't matter that it's dust versus latent heating. And it goes further than that because we also know that once you get these convective systems, that they can self-organize themselves into mesoscale or regional systems where they become their own dynamics. We're very familiar with that on Earth. This is a development of a mesoscale uh, convective complex uh, over the Great Plains. And you can see it's very large. This is not a single thunderstorm. It's an entire system that sets up because of sustained diabatic heating 
uh, over a long period of time. Right? If you heat a portion of the atmosphere over and over and over and over again at the same place, it gets hot, the pressure falls, you get a low pressure there and you can start to develop some quasi-balanced circulations from the Coriolis force. Okay. And when we do a simulation here on Mars of a dust storm, you can see these individual cells, but they start to organize, again, into larger scale convective systems. We should expect this. This should not be surprising. This should be an expectation that this type of stuff happens. <clears throat> Likewise, um, we can see this happen um, if we do idealized experiments of what happens when you heat a portion of Mars with dust. So if I put a, a big blob of, of dust on Mars in an idealized sense and just let it heat up, it will do exactly what we think should happen. It will get warm, the pressure at the center will hydrostatically fall, and give it enough time at the right latitude, you'll start to develop a circulation around that low pressure. And as that strengthens, the winds will pick up, and that, those winds will pick up more dust, which then makes that region dustier, which allows it to get hotter, which allows the pressure to fall more, which allows the winds to pick up, which allows more dust. Okay, So in an idealized experiment, you get essentially a dusty hurricane. Now, we don't see these on Mars because there's lots of complications that go on, but the point is you can do this because that's what the dynamics tell it to do. You have, the dynamics have no other choice. There is no other possibility. On Earth, we see this with hurricanes, okay? And we know that most tropical systems don't develop into hurricanes. You need very special conditions, but the same thing happens through the wind-induced sensible heat exchange uh, uh, feedback mechanism for hurricanes, right? You develop convection, it sits around for a while, you get a low pressure. That's a tropical depression, and it starts to slowly organize into a tropical storm as it sustains itself. Pressures fall, winds pick up, you get more evaporation and more energy from the ocean, which feeds the convection, which heats it up more, which drives the pressure, and you get the exact same analogous feedback mechanism, okay? And of course, because again, the dynamics don't care that it's moist convection versus dust, it's the same heating. Okay, so what about the importance of these things? Well, planetary convective systems are far more than just a curiosity. I mean, as a meteorologist, I like to look at them because they're cool, and actually that's enough for me, but um, they actually do things that are relevant to climate and other things. So one is the most important things is that they actually produce rapid and deep transport that can provide large magnitude sources and sinks of mass, chemical species or tracers, energy, momentum, okay? And all of those things then have noticeable impacts on the large scale structure. So if you were to take say an earth climate model and turn off deep convection parameterizations, to first order it will produce what looks like Earth, climate, and weather. It'll have a Hadley cell, it'll produce waves, you'll get baroclinic systems, you'll get storm systems. But when you look at the details, what you notice is that the angular momentum of the jets are completely off. Obviously, your water cycle is, is, is bizarro. Um, you will get little to no upper tropospheric moistening in the tropics, which we know exists. Okay? You will not get the correct stratosphere, uh, troposphere exchange of, of chemical species and ozone. There's really important things that happen. Okay. So on Earth, it's important for water vapor, for the moist static energy budget, for getting the jets, the momentum, for things like ozone. On Mars, we know it's important for dust because we can see dust. Okay. And I'm already in the red, huh? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I got one more slide and I'll cut it. We don't know about the rest of this stuff. TGO will help us. Titan, uh, methane probably is important, but we don't know about the rest of the stuff, dragonfly and the next Titan orbiter. And I'll just leave it here. Heating is important. I want to focus on this last one, though. We should anticipate the effects. They should be there. They have to be there. The surprise should not be that we find convection in an unstable atmosphere, or that we find a planetary wave in an atmosphere, or that mountains uh, produce waves, or that there's gravity waves. They ought to be there. The surprise should be if you don't find them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Scott. And we've got time for, I think, one brief question. Okay, Scott. One tiny nit. Yes. I agree almost 
98% with you, but yes. there's a tiny nit. And that is that the difference between, say, a dust storm on Mars yes. and the heating associated with that and latent heating, let's say, in a terrestrial thunderstorm is the vertical distribution of that yeah. heating. Right. And that will make a difference, yes. don't you think? And yeah. isn't that what we're really looking for? Isn't that the, because yeah. it's the couplings associated with that. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and, and you, are, you are correct. So what, what I think, if I, I'm going to kind of reinterpret your question here, what we ought to be focusing in is on the subtle differences or differences between those things rather than the, wow, I can't believe that this thing organized, right? Of course it does. So I think you're absolutely right. And so, uh, again, we shouldn't be surprised when we see those things, and we should be looking at, again, in the comparative sense, what are those small differences that produce those slightly different dynamical responses? So I agree with you 100% on that. 